I can't remember when I first met you, many, many years ago, many years before you were president of the Human Rights Commission, and you were, if I may say it, a sort of fairly typical international lawyer, you know, very plain and bland and quiet. You've become very passionate about this, mm. which is fantastic. It's a real human response, which every Australian should experience. But you're quite right. I mean, I've been a public international lawyer and I've advised governments and I've and, um, worked in the commercial law area. I've done a lot of work for oil and gas companies offshore. Mm. But I dealt with it at a fairly abstract legal advice level. Um, but when you're standing in the heat at Christmas Island uh, with a woman uh, with, with, with her baby um, wanting to know when she could be reunited with her family uh, or making her, her claim to asylum, these are people that you can't get out of your mind. Mm. Um, you can't uh, get the next plane back to Perth and say, well, she's a statistic, thank you very much for the interview, that was all very interesting, there's not much I can do, but I'll add you to the name in my social science study and I'll report to Parliament and thanks very much. You can't do that. Um, and so, in a way, I have become um, quite passionately committed to this because I've personally become responsible to those people. Mm. You cannot turn your back on them. My understanding is that immigration detention is virtually the only place in our society where you have pre-adolescent children trying to kill themselves. Is that consistent with what you found in yes. the... And, and, uh, very high levels of self-harm mm. um, and endless um, uh, statements by children that they saw their lives as being over. Mm. Um, one of the other uh, uh, really hurtful things to observe, as we did, is that the children sometimes turned on their parents and said, what, why have you done this to us? Mm. You mm. know, we were, we were happy in our village in Iran. We weren't aware of any of this. Uh, you've dragged us away and now you've left us in, in behind uh, wire uh, with the opprobrium, even if we are allowed out under guard to schools, the opprobrium of, of being in, in this situation. Why have you done this to us? Mm. It's mm. almost a primeval instinct that they actually self-harm and in a, some cases um, kill themselves. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a horrible thing to observe. Yeah. The, um, the odd irony of Australia's position of saying we want to stop the boats because we want to stop people drowning, um, what, what else will people do if they don't head down this way? What can they do? Stand their ground and be killed by their persecutors? Head north and run the risks of seeking asylum in other places? Aren't we really just shifting the burden to other places so that we won't see the suffering that... Oh, I think there's no doubt that, that that's what we're doing. We're just pushing it back. And um, I think the evidence demonstrates that fact, that if, they cut, if, we, if we block safe pathways, then you, you, they, they end up taking dangerous alternatives in other directions, yeah. so that Australia has quite simply washed its hands and said, the rest of the world can cope with this. Mm. We're going to do it. And this is another of these terrible myths uh, we are one of the top refugee receiving countries uh, in the world. We're doing our bit and the rest of you can just get on with it. Yeah. Um, the reality is that we're taking a tiny percentage of the 1% that's dealt with through resettlement processes of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. It's a tiny percentage, uh, but it, it, it's, it comes out well in the media by the minister. Mm. Um, it, it's, a, it's a deeply misleading st statistical statement. Um, but it, it makes most Australians feel comfortable. Of all the boat people who've arrived in Australia in the last, say, 15 or so years, uh, more than 90% are ultimately found to be refugees. They're not just having a holiday, they're not just moving on looking for a better life. They're actually escaping persecution. Well, that, which, means that, which means that if, they, if we turn them away, they will go somewhere that's else. That's right. And that is illegal. In other words, it's a reformant. Yeah. It's a return to the very risk of persecution that has actually justified 
their claim to refugee status. Mm. And, and I think that's a, a point that perhaps uh, needs to be better understood, that whether the figure's 85 or 90%, and it's even true of Papua New Guinea and Nauru, when they've done their own assessments mm. of refugees, they come up with a similar figure. Yep. So it, it, I, I'm, I'm rather impressed by that, 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 that Nauru and Papua New Guinea, through their own systems, have reached the same conclusions. And we have um, recently hosed out of the Migration Act all traces of the Refugees Convention. Well, that's so another... We've, we've imposed our own different test for... Yes, and, and the whole point about the Refugee Convention is it's, it's an international standard. Mm. Who is a refugee? What are the legal uh, rights of, of a state and obligations of a state, including no penalties? Uh, which Australia has manifestly ignored. But what is even more shocking, I think, to a Doc Evatt in the late 40s, is that we've stripped out those provisions of the Refugee Convention which were in the Migration Act that define these mm. terms by reference to the International Convention. Mm. They've been stripped out and it's now for the minister to determine what a refugee is. Yeah. And that is contrary uh, to the rule of law, in my view. Um, it is a highly discretionary, subjective view of the minister, which is, for most intents and purposes, not subject to judicial review by the courts. Now, the minister has also become the person in charge of a sort of super ministry. Well, I think it, it's, uh, it's very sad because uh, historically, of course, the Department of Immigration was a place of um, welcome. It was regulated migration, but it was a place of welcome and positivity recognising the value that migrants, including refugees, bring to Australia. Now we've put the department together with border control, customs, management of terrorism, all in one super ministry, giving one minister virtually unprecedented um, ministerial discretion, uh, avoiding the scrutiny of the courts on many aspects of his powers. I think there are very real concerns in Australia's democracy um, because of the very high level of power of the minister and the inability of the courts uh, to, to exercise a proper judicial control of the way in which those powers are being exercised. How would you describe the position of human rights in Australia now? Well, I think I, I, I've thought a lot about this. Um, I think it's regressive at the moment. On almost any indice you care to think about, Australia has either um, stagnated or gone backwards. Incarceration of Indigenous Australians um, is now 10 times worse than it was when the Human Rights Commission did a report on, on the incarceration and deaths in custody. Um, the violence against women is getting worse. There seems to be no movement with regard to asylum seekers and refugees. Um, we have rising rates of youth suicide. Um, but perhaps even more troubling from a legal perspective is that we have a growing willingness in Australia to say, well, we don't really respect these human rights standards, and even if they are legally binding in Australia, we should even contemplate withdrawing from them. Mm. Um, the, this, this government has had a platform of abolishing the Human Rights Commission, um, and there was even talk of withdrawing from the Refugees Convention. So I think that there is a growing disrespect for human rights um, and, and a regression in relation to vulnerable people that we would see as important. Mm. I can hardly believe that in the second decade of the 21st century, this is what we're doing in Australia. Mm.